Good morning. Happy Labor Day. Welcome to all of you that join us in person on Facebook Live and on Zoom. And as I realized as I was getting ready to sit down that people wonder what I'm doing when I do this and then this. Well, I'm, it, those are the sign language to ring the bell. So if you're on Zoom or you're on Facebook Live, goes, what is she doing? Well, that's what I'm doing. Bob's up there ready to ring the bell, but he doesn't know it's time <laughs> yet. So anyway, if you're wondering about those crazy movements, that's what it was. This morning, um, a little sad news. Um, Fred Becker has been in a nursing home, and Judith called me yesterday, and he's been on hospice these last few weeks. And they called her and told her that it wouldn't be long. So I um, said we'd be praying this morning for Fred and for her, because she was going to head over to the nursing home this morning to be with him. So he will be in our prayers this day. There are events and things in the bulletin inside on the insert, so keep an eye on those. And then next Sunday, I invite you to stay after just for a few minutes while we uh, session gives an update on what's happening with the Pitzer property gift that was given, and you will be given the opportunity to offer input. So everybody is welcome. It's not a congregational meeting. It's kind of like a midway report, if you will, for everyone to stay and listen. Any other announcements? Yes, Debbie. Wonderful. There's goodies back there. Yes, ma'am. Tracy. Um, there's a new sign-up paper on the bulletin board for uh, offering for September and October. Oh, good. For uh, folks to collect offering. Yes? Yes. So please look. It was empty, but now it's full a place for you to fill in your name. Anybody can be an usher or a greeter uh, and, and collect offerings. So that means anybody can sign up. <laughs> Any other announcements? Let's go to God in prayer as we begin to worship. Holy God, we bring all that we are to you in worship today. And we come in and we bring, you know, the distractions that come with us. We bring the failures or the frustrations that follow us along. We bring our scattered thinking and, and all, that, all that we are. And we submit ourselves to you again, knowing that by ourselves we can't do much, but trusting in your love that calls us here in Jesus, all things are possible. We believe you accept this worship because of Jesus and your Holy Spirit who leads us as we praise you and begin to live out and understand your word for us. Glory to you, God, our Father. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, thank you for new chances to have our eyes opened and to get out of our ruts. Thank you for your word to us this day. May we hear your call to us and then answer yes with our whole selves. Amen. Our first scripture lesson comes from Deuteronomy. I'll be reading um, chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking his, in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but you are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to pass, to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding, to, holding fast to him, 
for that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our second scripture this morning is from Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Hear God's word. Now large crowds were traveling with him, that is, Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciples if you do not give up all your possessions. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Jesus must have attracted much attention in the days he walked this earth. He was definitely not like the other religious leaders. Scripture says he spoke as one with authority. He noticed and healed those who were ill or lame. Even on the Sabbath, he spoke of and to God as if he actually knew God, his Abba, personally. Even when Jesus was trying to get away for a little rest with his disciples, the crowds came and found him. And we have the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 as a result. As I looked in scripture, there were 48 references to crowds in the Gospels. People seemed to be fascinated by him, that is Jesus. Word spread, and in Mark's gospel we read, but he, the leper who had been healed, went out and began to proclaim freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly. But he had to stay out in the country so that people could come out to him. They enjoyed Jesus' teaching and the way he would spar with the religious officials. Much of the time when Jesus spoke, he was using everyday stories things they could understand. You heard them in today's scripture in Luke. There were some everyday events that they knew about in that scripture. I'm sure the people thought this was great fun, but Jesus was not traveling around just to provide a good show or entertaining dialogue. As Jesus told his disciples when they came to get him one time because others were searching for him, he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom to other cities also. For I was sent for this purpose. So was this good news just for people to think about, you know, to muse on? Was it for them to discuss and debate, you know, lunchtime conversation? Or was this to be tucked away until they saw him again? Well, today's teaching shows us Jesus expects much more than that. Crowds in today's society can be a sign of success. Sporting events, Fireworks, theme parks, concerts, speaking events, parades, churches often determine their success by the numbers who attend. But for Jesus, I don't think it was about the numbers. Not so much, but his compassion he had for the crowd. He cared for those who came. He taught them, he healed them, and he asked his disciples to find something for them to eat. Today in this passage, we heard Jesus explaining another truth to the crowds. His first words to him were, whoever comes to me. Jesus' invitation 
was given to everyone, to each one who came to him. Not just to watch him from the sidelines. Jesus says essentially, come to me and I will show you life and how you can be involved in the kingdom life that I'm talking about and doing. Here's how it's going to happen. One, it begins with priorities. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Our love for Jesus can't be sandwiched in on top of our love for everything else. You know, someplace in that sandwich, there's our love for Jesus. No, that, that's not going to work. Second, there is a price of discipleship. Your own life is the price. Unless you're crucified, you cannot follow Jesus and be his disciple. Third, discipleship costs must be weighed. This isn't just entertainment where you sit and listen. This is the kingdom life of God. Each one is invited to participate. And you wouldn't start something that you didn't check to see if you were committed to finishing it. Or in the case of a strong opponent, you would consider first whether that opponent was more powerful for you than you, whether you had a chance over that one. Otherwise, you would make nego begin negotiations for peace. And last, the weight of our possessions, our stuff, can get in the way of true life and true discipleship. Put simply, discipleship is not a sideline side activity. Jesus is not feeling successful because there's huge crowds came just to listen, but had no interest or inclination to participate. At first, to me, it kind of looked like Jesus was trying to discourage the crowds, but I actually think he was trying to encourage the crowd even more. Remember how I told you there are 48 verses about crowds? Yes, but there are 320 verses that have either disciple or disciples in them. Jesus is much more interested in bringing people from a crowd into a relationship of a disciple than having all those crowds just flock around him. Well, let's look closer at that list Jesus offered. The first warning Jesus gives kind of reminded me of Deuteronomy this morning. Because out of the RSV it reads in Deuteronomy 30, 15, See, I have set before you, where are you? There we go. See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. The RSV gets down to just the brass text, no fancy words in there. Jesus also seems to be saying, let's get down to what's important. The first statement is regarding relationships, and the last one, number four, is regarding stuff. So who or what is going to have first place, priority in your life, in my life? Maybe we say it another way. What gives us or who gives us life? Hating is such a strong word, Jesus. It seems like he wanted to get people's attention, I think. Because the word hate will get your attention. But how can Jesus say hate when he's the one that said, love one another as I have loved you? What is Jesus really saying? Who gives you eternal life, I think is what he's asking. Are we living that eternal life now? He's saying eternal life begins when we love him more than anyone else. Well, can our job or our children or our spouse or our bank account or investments, our cars, our volunteer jobs give us life? We may feel like without them, we would not have life. But that may be because we put our trust in them rather than in Jesus. According to scripture, only God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit alone has immortality, life forever and ever. God and the love of God is life and goodness. All else is death and evil. Well, that puts it pretty straight. 
To have life, Jesus reminds this crowd, and he reminds the crowd here, that we need to receive his love. Let him have first place in our love over and above any other person and more than even our own life. Jesus is so wise. He would be, wouldn't he, since he's our savior. It is only when we love him most of all that we won't hate others in our lives. You want to hear that again? Only when we love him most of all that we won't hate the others in our lives. But wait, that doesn't make sense. He said we had to hate them. Well, you see, if we depend on others in our lives for our hope and our life and our love, we will hate them when they don't live up to our expectations. None of them can make us whole. Nobody else. Not all the stuff you have. Not any of the things we own. But if we depend on Jesus and his life and his love, we will have eternal life and can share his love and life that he gives us with all others. In the same way, all our possessions cannot give us life <clears throat> or love. They are useless to us. So when we give them up to Jesus, whatever that is, that stuff we're giving up, they are now at Jesus' disposal. Until we do this on a personal level or on a church level, an organizational level, we will have a problem with idols in our lives. Our money, our buildings, our stuff, our valuables, our people, whatever it is, will have a hold on us. <clears throat> Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Next item on his list, Jesus said, or seems to be saying, unless we're willing to be humbled, crucified is actually the word he used, to carry a cross, which means you're going to be crucified, <laughs> to be spent in whatever way seems best for the proclamation of the good news of God's love in Jesus. Then we can't be his disciples. We're still part of the crowd. Actually, this idea of crucifying, of giving up our life, of being spent, or all of us for that, <clears throat> is what we do in our baptism. We die with Christ in the water, and we rise to new life, offering up ourselves, our getting rid of our selfishness by crucifying whatever it is, and trusting more and more in Jesus who gives us life. And then we continue all our life, don't we? We remember our baptism. Every time someone's baptized, every time we talk about it, remembering and learning to let go of life more and more, let go of life on our terms and receive life from Jesus on his terms. And his third statement is the one we must consider carefully. Oh the others too, but he wants us to particularly pay attention. We must count the cost, as I talked with the children. Are we ready to hand over our dreams and our aspirations to Jesus, whatever they are? Our hopes and our goals? How about our disappointments and our failures? We're we gonna give those to him too? You see, this is submission. Jesus is talking about as we, this is what Jesus is talking about. As we look at God's power in Jesus, and then we look at ourselves, how are you doing? How do you match up against that power of God raising Christ from the dead and your own power? Are we willing to consider submission and his terms for peace? Otherwise, we're going to be at war. What will submitting to Christ cost us today? And are we willing? Do we want peace? This, when I was writing this, I had a whole different thing I was going to say, because it, but this took me right back to when um, I was hoping and praying to have children. That was a very long time ago now. It was in my first marriage. We'd gone through fertility testing, no babies. 
And so the doctor said the only thing left was to try was fertility drugs. So I said, sure. Took those one time and I was pregnant. Oh, I was ecstatic. I was overjoyed. I was so happy. And then they did the ultrasound and there were two babies. I was overwhelmed. I was upset. I was like, what? Two? No, not two. Two babies? How could I handle two babies? God was very good to me. I had thought I could handle one baby. I was so young and full of myself. God surely allowed me to be in the place of having one baby too much for me to handle in twin baby girls. Because it was in that place of sinking is what I felt like I was doing, or I could surrender. I finally relinquished or surrendered myself to Jesus yet again. I knew I could not handle taking care of two babies, so I began to do the only thing I could do was to trust God in Jesus and the Holy Spirit. As we look at our life and our situation, and you know, that was, having those kids was, was 16 years since I had accepted Christ as a young girl. My life was very different. I had to accept Christ all over again. And when we have these times in our lives, when things change, our situations change, we have to again take stock in our family, our possessions, ourselves, and say, well, how am I doing? Can I handle all of this alone? Is that what I want to do? Or do we want peace? <laughs> that peace that Jesus is talking about in this scripture. In the scripture we read Irene in Greek, but in Hebrew it's shalom. And I just want to tell you, Jesus was speaking shalom. The health, welfare, prosperity, like we heard in Deuteronomy, which is goodness. The goodness and completeness and fullness of life. This is what Jesus is asking us to consider. Jesus is suggesting that we can't find this shalom in our family, in our work, in our possessions, and in all the rest of the stuff we have unless we first have it and find it in him. And sometimes, because God is good to us, he lets our circumstances be greater than we can handle. Do not believe that garbage that says God only gives you what you can handle. It's not true. God lets us have a whole lot more than we can handle so that we can trust in him. We can't find true life for eternity by ourselves in any of the things you can point to in your life. The only way to life and peace is in the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and my peace I give to you. To have Jesus' love and life and peace means submission. Submitting to crucifixion, submitting again to living in Jesus, and Jesus living in us. And you say, Karen, I've heard this sermon before. Yes, you have. And Jesus said, you need to do it daily. You need to have this sermon every day with yourself. Because it's a daily event. Giving up our control. Giving in to him all that we have. To have his true shalom. Eternal life and peace. You see, this is the way from glory to glory. It's a lifelong process of relinquishment. We keep finding more and more joy and peace in Jesus as we give up more and more of the tight hold we have on so many things. And we then become more awakened to his Holy Spirit who whispers in our hearts and in our minds, who invites us to come close because Jesus wants us right there in him and so he can be in us. And then we'll learn that we don't have to handle everything ourselves. 
we are forever held in his love as we live in Christ and become his disciples here on earth. Amen. And as I say with the children, let us pray about that. Lord God, as children, sometimes we are taught to pray by clasping our hands. And sometimes people taught us to pray by putting our hands together. But sometimes, God, we need to pray with our hands open. Realizing that we hold on to nothing when we come to you. That we can't hold on to this life and have life. We can't hold on to our family and have our family. We can't hold on to our possessions and have anything of worth unless we open our hands and give these, all these gifts, all that we have or are to you in Christ. Even the stuff that we hold on to that isn't good. Even, even the, the anger that we may still hold or the resentment. Even the disappointment or the failure we are still remembering. Even the words we said that we shouldn't have said. You'll take all that too. The only way we can live as if you do take all of that and teach us how to walk with your son Jesus, to let Jesus walk in us and love in us and joy in us and kind be kind in us. Because then we have life eternal in the kingdom here. Before we ever reach wherever that is that you call heaven. That starts now. Thank you, Jesus, for reminding us again today that it is an everyday event to offer when we first wake up to invite this day, today, to be yours. So Lord, this day we invite this congregation to be yours, to the work that we do for you to be yours, and that we would be your people because you are living and loving through us. And Lord, in our world, the world doesn't understand that. The world, the world sets the goals and the, the numbers in front of us because numbers mean everything in the world. It's how many people and it's how much you have and it's how fast or how good you do it and it's, it's the excellence of the world's standards, but your standards, oh God, are different. Would you keep us close to you when we walk out those doors? That we won't fall prey to the world's the number game. That we won't fall into the worries of the world. That we won't fall into all that glitters its gold and be mesmerized by that. But instead, remember, it's only in giving up that we gain eternity, which is worth more than anything the world can offer us. Because eternity means life in Christ and Christ in us, who is the way, the truth, and the life. 
Lord, would you help us this morning as we pray? For there are those that have been asked to be on our prayer list here and those that are on our hearts this morning. And one of those is Fred Becker. I thank you, God, that you whispered that I should go visit Fred this week. And I did. And I was glad to pray with him. And I was glad he recognized me. And I thank you for being and holding him close this morning, and Judith too, and Jeff, and their family. And I thank you that the promises that you made to Fred and that Fred made to you are bearing fruit soon. And we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for your love that never lets go of him. And Lord, this morning we lift up those who are living with diagnoses that are troublesome, like Kimberly Knight with breast cancer and Denise Bartigas who has endometrial cancer, Janine Campbell with breast cancer. Lord, there are others. Um, Jane Wassum who's overcoming COVID in Care Haven. Dorothy Teeter, who is having kidney and heart issues. Eric Frank and Margie, who both have Parkinson's. Judy Hartman, who has cancer. Cindy Sensodiver with pancreatic cancer. Lord, there are others whose names come to mind. Lord, we, we relinquish what we think might happen. And instead, we offer each of these people in, in, to pray with you and to pray in your life, Jesus, for each one. We believe that you have life until you tell us different. You have healing for each of these people, Lord. So we trust in you for the healing you have. And we have faith for the healing that has happened. Lord, we bless you. We bless you and thank you for the healing in Amelia. As we think about this month of where many children, uh, the cancer they carry is raised up to our consciousness. We praise you for Amelia being free of cancer. And Lord, this day, there are others in our congregation that can say, praise you, Lord, I'm free of and fill in the blank. And we thank you for that. And we thank you, Lord, that Harriet Cop is home. And she is recovering well at home. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord, even when we're not sure what the outcome will be. We praise you, Lord. For in you there is life, and we trust that that life is everlasting. And so we can put all things in your hands, including ourselves, and bless you for being in us, in our marriages, in our singleness, in our, in our retiredness, in our, wherever we find ourselves in life, Lord, you are there. And we ask for you to make us fruitful and to make us yours that we might be your people here in the kingdom, sharing your life and your love with those you place in our path. We pray this in the amazing and wondrous name of Jesus, who calls us and taught us and continues to teach us to pray as we pray together using the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Let us... Say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe 
in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he sits judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is 438, Rock of Ages. If the Lord has given you too much, give thanks, because then you have to trust in him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.